Now, why volume is equal to Kx not okay? I understand. Basket, there was some conditions that were given to us. Okay. This was part of what is given in the question. The relationship between spring constant and this. The volume is Lx, uh, A into x naught. Area of cross section of the piston. So this is also given. No? X naught here is the initial length of value of x. So from this you can see that initial volume is A into x naught. So you are using these things in the equation below. Use this equation below. So that is how you are getting that initially if the compression of the spring is x1. Okay. So x1 is initial compression. Oh sorry, sorry. Uh, my mistake. X1 is not a compression, it's an extension. Just uh, make a correction here. Okay, so let's let's just uh, go through this again. So this is an initial extension. So the spring is pulling it up. No? So that is why now when you go up to a distance x. This will change. This will all change. But you get the idea, you get a similar kind of expression. So now let us say the spring force is still extended, but it has changed to x1 minus x1 uh, minus x for this case. Okay? So the piston has a displacement of x upwards. Therefore, the spring now has an extension, which is the initial value of extension minus x. So we have spring force plus pressure into area is equal to P naught A plus M. So now we will make use of so P A is becoming P naught A plus M B minus P X one plus things like this, okay, as you can see. So now this term, if you substitute from there, this term is zero. From initial state, we know that Ax1 was equal to Mg. So these two terms cancel. So what is the pressure becoming? It is becoming P0 plus Kx by E minus okay. So this is the expression for pressure as a function of x. You just have to substitute that. Okay. And then of course you have this. So the extension of the spring as a function of x is becoming like this. This is my equation one. It's giving me this. And of course, from equation of state, I will also get Pv upon P is equal to P not V not upon P not. So the volume at this time is becoming this. So P into X not plus X upon P is equal to P not into X not upon P. That's my second equation, which is coming from equation of state. This is coming from pistons A P. Pistons equilibrium because we are moving it very slowly. So, equation 1 is coming from the pistons equilibrium. The natural length is not important because just the initial state is required. Okay. So,
So now we will calculate the final state using this relation. So the final state here will become such that the volume has become 3 V naught by 2. So that means that displacement of the piston is X naught by 2. So the pressure of the gas would have increased to V naught plus KX naught by 2. And we had earlier that KX naught was equal to 4 mg, which was equal to 2 P naught. So, Kx0 can be replaced with this. So, the final pressure is becoming. Because that was the relation given to us in the question itself that Kx0 is 2p0a <coughs> or 4m. So if the final pressure is this, and the final volume is P by 2 V naught, then the final temperature will become, so this is final, it will become 3 times P. So it's going from a state of P naught, V naught, P naught to a state of 2 P naught, 3 by 2 V naught. So, hope this part is clear, people. So, I'll just take you through the terms we have used. So, at some intermediate time t, if your piston has displaced upwards by x. So spring kya tha? initially it was extended by x1. Now you say x super chala gaya na? so its extension will become x1 minus x. Now in case this extension becomes a negative quantity, in case x becomes greater than x1, then what will happen is that it will actually be in a state of compression. So here you understand that if x becomes greater than x1, implies that the spring is now compressed. I think that is what will be happening because my x1 was equal to how much? My x1 was x0 by 4. Okay. And you are taking it up by actually x0 by 2. So you can understand that, that the final state of the spring okay, is that the, um, uh, the extension is becoming x1 minus x final the displacement so x1 was x0 by 4 let's see and we are taking it up by x0 by 2 so minus x0 by 4 which means that the spring final state of the spring is a compression of x0 by 4 that is the initial state so this is the initial state the final state in the initial state the spring had an extension of x0 by 4. In the final state, this spring has a compression of x0 by 4. So that's just a matter of chance over here. That's what's happening. If we had taken the final volume as something else, it would not have been a case like this, but that's what's happening. So these three equations are the important equation one, two, and three. 
Three of those I haven't used yet, which is the work in it. I mean, the uh, first law of thermodynamics. Okay, so now let's come to the application of first law of thermodynamics. So the heat supplied by your heating element is equal to the change in internal energy of the gas plus the work done by the gas. So here delta U of course will be by formula. N F by 2 R delta T. So as we saw that was 3 by 2 N R into final temperature minus initial temperature. Okay. Or we can also write this as 3 by 2 into product of final volume into final pressure minus this. So whichever way we do it, we can see that we get this as 3 by 2 into 2 P naught. Of course, the final pressure was becoming 2 P naught. And the initial volume, sorry, and the final volume is 3 by 2, which will become 3 P naught V naught minus this. So, so 3 into 50 or positive of 150 joules is the change in internal energy of the gas. That's the easy part. Now, what about work done by the gas? It, one way of calculating is we can calculate the work done by the gas as integration E d u. So in this case, the instantaneous pressure when the gas was in the intermediate state, at, at this state, the instantaneous pressure was given by this equation. It was P naught plus P x upon E. So the right is says, P naught plus Px upon E, that's the pressure into the small change in volume is E dx. Directly integrate this from x equal to 0 to x equal to x naught by T. Because x was the displacement of the piston, it is not the state of the spring. So this will give us P naught P into x plus half Px square. Going from x equal to 0 to x equal to x naught by 2. So we will get P naught A x naught by 2 plus C A ki 1 by 8 P x naught square. So that is nothing but P naught V naught by 2 plus. Now this P x naught remember was equal to um, 2 P naught V naught. This was the relation given to us. So here that P x naught is equal to 2 P naught into P x naught V naught. So therefore, 1 by 8 Px naught square will become 1 by 8 of 2 P naught E plus Px naught into x naught. So this becomes 1 by 4 P naught E. So this term can be written like this. So work done by the gas is becoming 3 by 4, not or 3 fourths of 50 joules. So that is how much? 37.5 joules. 
This is the work done by the gas. And Q we have already calculated. Q was equal to one. I'm sorry, delta U was one fifty degrees. So therefore, Q will become W plus delta U. Q is becoming this plus one fifty. So one eighty seven point five degrees is the amount of heat we have supplied in this particular case. Okay, so this is just one method. I'll, I'll show you a logical way of doing this also. Here I have just done it by integration. By using the relation that work done by the gas is integration PD. And I had already calculated instantaneous pressure as a function of X. It was the displacement of the piston in the upward direction. Earlier on. Now there's also a logical way of calculating this work done by the gas where we can avoid integration. So just as you are going through this and noting this down, think about that and tell me if you can verify that that will give you the same thing.
Okay, so anybody worked out uh, another option of calculating the work done by the gas? See, what is happening is, if you consider this thing, what the gas is doing is supplying a force of pressure into area, which is balancing the combination of these forces mg and spring force so what is happening is that work done by the gas is equal to work done against the same atmospheric pressure plus change in gravitational potential energy of the piston plus change in elastic potential energy of the system. You can also understand it this way. So, work done by the gas should be equal to E0 into E into whatever displacement it is having plus mg into vertical displacement x plus half k x final of the spring square minus x initial of the spring square. Now this final state of the spring was a compression of x naught by 4 whereas the initial state of the spring was an extension of x naught by 4. So in this particular case this term becomes this becomes mg x naught by 2 and this becomes e naught e into x naught by 2. Now we also know that mg was equal to e naught e by 2 because it was given to us that ax naught is equal to 4 m equal to 2 e naught e. This is what was given to us. Substitute all that here. So this is P naught V naught by 2 plus V naught Ax naught by 4. So the key by 4, which is the work done by the gas, which is your 37.5. So in this type of question, you can also calculate the work done by using a sort of logical explanation of work done. So this is the work done by using work energy kind of. People hope this is clear. Yeah, and rest of the thing you have to do in that way. The final state from the state will get the state function which is delta u. So q will become the sum of the state function delta u plus the path function w. But here you can also calculate the path function w by work energy method. Something like this. All right, let's look at one more question of heat and thermodynamics before we move on to other sections.
this is some kind of a cylinder like this then what is happening is that this is adiabatic cylinder this side is also adiabatic cap or wall or whatever but however this side this is a conducting wall and we also have ideal spring connected like this and this is a free but non conducting piston the area of the piston is and this length is x1 this part of this outside atmospheric temperature is in that this is chamber a let us say chamber b let us say and we also have again a heating element to pass electric current through this it can heat the gas in chamber b now all the things given to us are this that chamber a and b are filled with helium and oxygen respectively initially pressure in chamber a is equal to pressure in chamber b equal to atmospheric pressure it that is 10 degrees per 5 pascals and x1 is equal to x2 such that volume of gas a is equal to volume of gas b is equal to let us say 5 meters now heat is slowly supplied to the heating element until the gas in chamber b compresses to 3 liters also given that d into So this condition is given to us. So from this we have to now find Q. That is supplied. Yes.
is the area of the piston mass or so that you don't confuse it with the name of the chamber let's make it a not a not is the area of the piston or the area of the chamber so these type of questions are a little bit extra tricky in mechanical thermodynamics where there is a spring involved and what to consider that kind of situation by the way you can also do a version of this uh, question where there is no spring that's a easier version of this question Remember that the uh, the red colored wall on the right hand side of B is a conducting wall, okay, and you are supplying the heat slowly, so it's oscillatory process. And T naught is the outside atmospheric temperature. And also, temperature of E is equal to temperature of B equal to T naught initially. That's three hundred Kelvin. That's the additional information. The initial temperature of gas in A and B are also equal. That's equal to atmospheric temperature three hundred Kelvin.
क्योंकि जस्ट मिनट स्टूडेंट्स आई हैव गॉट माय इंटरनेट कनेक्शन गॉट डिस्टर्बेड फॉर अ मोमेंट सो आई जस्ट नीड अ मिनट टू रीकनेक्ट एवरीथिंग so anybody got the final state the two gases in this case so the hint to you in this case what is happening is the one of the gases is undergoing a known process can you tell me which one and what it is out of the two chambers a and b in one of them there is a known process which is happening that's because what because this wall is conducting so as you are supplying heat to gas a this piston is pushing in gas b is getting compressed but while that's happening what about the temperature of the gas b it's remaining constant because it's a conducting wall is this point clear omkar baskar and chakshu so that will help you solve the problem because b is undergoing an isothermal compression okay good so once you understand that here you can solve the problem more easily gas in chamber b is undergoing an isothermal compression now initially pa was equal to pv equal to p0 so therefore x of the spring would have been zero no, because the piston pressure is balanced from those both sides so forces are balanced and va was equal to vb equal to p0 x0 which was 5 liters temperature of a was equal to temperature of b now at some time p so volume of a would have become x not plus x into this area volume of b would have become x not minus x to this area now for the chamber b 
isothermal compression so temperature is remaining t not okay. so pressure of b is becoming t not v not upon t so this is going to be t not into x not upon x not minus x And now, from the free body diagram of the piston, you will understand that pressure into area, pressure into area, and spring force. So, for chamber E. From that, we can find the temperature. Now, you apply the concept of final state. So,
x कितना हो जाएगा so bb which is x not minus x into b is three fifths of b not three by five From this only, you would have known that x is equal to two by five x one. So now we will know the final pressure of E from this. Given to us that E x naught is equal to four P naught A naught. So K X naught upon A will become four P naught. So this will become five by three plus three by five. So this is the final state of E. Now we have to find how much heat is supplied.
Okay, so people hope this is clear so far. Now, as far as the work done by A is concerned, oh sorry, the heat supplied to A is concerned, it's a state function. So, again, if you do it by direct application, it will be a little tricky because you will end up integrating this kind of a term over here. And one option is you can use this. The other option is you can do this logically also. So heat supplied to A is equal to delta U for A plus work done by A. So so delta U for A is very simple. It is n into F by two R delta T. Uh, that is F by two into final pressure into volume minus initial pressure into volume. So this will be able to calculate. <clears throat> because this is given to as a monoatomic gas. And this was 3.27 into 10 raised power 5 pascals into final volume was 7 liters. So that is 7 into 10 raised power minus 3 meter cube. So this is Pascal into meter cube that is in joules, whereas initial pressure was 10 raised power 5 pascals and volume was 5 liters. So you can see this is fairly easy to calculate. Something like this. 22.89 minus 5 into 10 days part 2. This is delta U for E. But WA, which is the work done by E. So there are two ways you can do this. One is you can calculate work done by integration of pressure into change in volume. That's one option. Or you can also use work energy. If you use work energy, you see here that work done by E by gas is equal to this work done on B plus change in potential energy of the spring. You can use this method also. So one of either of these two you can use to find out the work done by the gas. And then finally your QA will become the sum of delta U A plus. Okay. So work this out quickly. Okay.
application. Hope you work this out by now. So if you go by the pressure into integrated over this, you will have to use this relation. So work done by E. Let's first write this one as dx dx integrated. So you get accordingly. So this is nothing but T naught D naught. This will be minus ln of x naught minus x, but from this to this, when you calculate, you will get this as ln 5 by. Five by three I mean. so calculate this term it will come five by three because that x naught minus two by five is three by five and this term will become half t into four by twenty five x naught square. So we get d naught d naught ln five by three plus Two by twenty five T X naught square. And again, we'll use that relation that the T X naught relation which will be in this. So four T naught T naught. So this will become two by twenty five into four T naught T naught X naught. That is P naught B naught into ln 5 by 3 plus 8 by 24. So that P naught B naught is 5 into 10 to the square 2 joules into natural log of 5 by 3 plus 8 by 20. This should be our final work done by. So when we have this method, you can see it's giving us P naught V naught ln 5 by 3 plus 8 by 25. And you see this method will also give us the same because work done by V will come up come as NRT naught, natural log of V final by V division. So this work done by V will come out to be a negative quantity because it's compressing. This will come out V naught V naught ln 3 by 5. So the final volume is 3 liters. So therefore, minus W or the work done on the gas V. That will come out to be P naught V naught ln 5 by 3. And the change in potential energy of the spring, delta U of the spring, is that half K x square. So that is so 
that is your 2 by 25 dx one square or that becomes 8 by 25 do not do that as the calculation is so this is delta in the distance so therefore you can see that work done by the gas C is equal to work done on B plus change in potential energy and then finally QA is equal to delta U of A plus work done by A. delta U we had already calculated so these are the various you know, tricks and methods and things that you can apply this sort of a question Okay, so people hope this is clear. So I'll send you the whiteboard notes, you can go through the exact calculation. More important thing is the method. Now, people, uh, few of the questions you had sent last time, uh, are they still pending or have you solved them? I'm just uh, putting up. Example, there was this uh, question it was based on that rod which was moving with variable force acting on it and we have to calculate the EMF induced. So have you worked out this question or is it still pending? This one, you had a metallic rod and you were applying a variable force on it like this. This force was, I think, a linear function of time. This force was 4t in newtons. The t was time in seconds. Done. Okay. okay. Uh, what about the previous one? The conical pendulum one, angular momentum, that question. That also done? Anything pending from that set? Okay, no problem. Let's continue ahead with some more examples. Then, uh, Bhaskar, your question was which one? Okay, I'll, I'll look for it, Master. Just give me some time. In the meantime, let me give you another question. This question is a little bit to do with impulse momentum kind of concept. So this is a wedge of mass capital M, which has a smooth spherical 
cavity kind of thing of radius r now what is also happening is that this is lying at the corner of a smooth surface horizontal surface and a wall on this side there is a wall and on this this is a smooth horizontal Surface. Now what we do is we release a particle of mass small m at that point from this. So this example a particle of m equal to capital M by T e is released. From rest, from the point P. So first of all, find the maximum height from say, C, where C is the bottom of the pit. Point. bottom of that hemispherical pit so the maximum height from C to which the particle small m will Climb after passing through C for the first time. And secondly, we have to find the maximum speed, the wedge will achieve. So given G is equal to 10 meters per second square and capital R is equal to 20 meters. And this ratio of mass by mass is given. Also, assume the wedge is against the wall, but not attached to it, but not attached or glued to it initially. Okay, check so I'll go through that first to the set. Master, if you can also send me The yeah, check your answer, Basta, just give me a second.
Anybody else got the answer? Okay, so I think your answers for maximum height are correct. So as you can see here, what will happen is that the wedge will remain in contact with the wall till the particle comes to the point C. At this state, what is that mean? The particle is moving with some E1, let's say, and the wedge is at rest. So that V1 is obviously the root 2 GR. But now this loses contact. And once it loses contact, linear momentum is converted. So now by the time Which reaches the highest point here, its relative velocity with respect to the frequency. So the whole system moves with a common velocity. So m plus m v, so v2 at this stage, is equal to m v1. And whatever this height climbs. So substitute this here. So you can see this is becoming M V one whole square by two times M plus M. Now substitute the ratio of the masses. So this can be written as half m v one square upon eight times small m plus m. H will come out to be V1 square by 2G. Now the next thing you have to think is that at what point of time the speed of this thing will be maximum, the wedge will be maximum. What is happening that for this system, the horizontal linear momentum is conserved. So Px for the system is 
therefore v for the wedge is maximum when v for the particle as maximum negative x component so that will happen at the instant when one from this state it will seem this state that the whole thing was moving at b2 which was at the maximum height and b relative was zero and then we come to situation like this where this is moving backwards at let's say some b prime that point of time this will be moving forward at the maximum speed okay bas but i look into this question also so now for this we max we just compare this with this so mv1 should be equal to minus mv prime Plus capital M. Next, and <coughs> so you solve these two equations. This equation actually becomes two G R is equal to B prime square plus P times B max. And this becomes that B prime is equal to E B max minus B max. So again, this B one square term and this we cancel. So as you can see, we have. So one root will be V max equal to zero. So that's not the exception. That's the initial state. The other root will become V max equal to sixteen by seventy-two times V one. Or So you're getting slightly different answers. Just check your calculation. So both of you, Chakshu and 
Bhaskar have got different answers. One has got 160 by 9, the other has got 20 by 9. Just check your calculations. And I am also getting a different value altogether. But I hope you have applied the same method. Okay, so hope this question is clear, people. Ask her, Tepsu and Omkar, is this question clear? Okay. Okay, so I have got a couple of questions which you have sent as doubt. So just give me a bit of time, I'll work them out and send you this. In the meantime, next question I want you to solve. Uh, before that, just a moment, I'll start this. I also wanted to start a bit of Practice revision from waves. So, I was thinking of working out some questions based on mechanical waves. So, we have this kind of situation in my next example. S1 and S2 are two synchronized sound sources like tuning forks. Frequency, let's say 500 hertz each. 
and take root of gamma r t by m for the atmospheric air at this moment approximately 300 meters per second. Now the distance between S1 S2 that is the distance d is equal to something I'll give this value to now a detector moves on a circular path of radius r r is very large compared to d so find the angular positions theta at which he experiences constructive or destructive interference. Uh, this is a I will give you the value of the D. Uh, One point eight meters is the value of D, but capital R is much larger. So let's say hundred meters or something like that. So you have to find the this angular position is theta at some instant. So as he's moving along this circular path, you have to find the values of theta at which he experiences constructive or destructive interference. Oh, speed is not visible. Sorry.
Yes, that is correct. Constructive interference, that is correct. Chakshu, your answer is correct. Bhaskar, your answer is not correct. It's not 60 and so, so here, you would have to do a bit of the approximation method. So first of all, from calculation, you can see that your lambda is B by F, so it is 0.6 meters. And your B is 1.8 meters, that means B is equal to B lambda. So that means that theta equal to zero, you're getting constructive interference. And at theta equal to 90 degrees, your path difference will be zero. Because here your path difference will be three lambda. Okay, but in between these two, there will be some one more theta one and theta two, at which your path difference will be equal to two lambda, and your path difference will be equal to lambda. So in all, you will get theta equal to zero, theta equal to some theta one, which we have to calculate, theta equal to some theta two, which we have to calculate, and theta equal to ninety, at which you are getting uh, constructive interference. Okay. And similarly, you will get some positions for destructive. So we come to that. So let's calculate how we can calculate. Uh, let's look at how we can get the path difference as an easy relationship of theta. So this is where our small angle approximation will come in a little bit. So we are now considering S1, S2. And we are considering any arbitrary point at an angular position theta. So your path difference is S1P minus S2P. So in this, uh, this kind of situation. And consider the midpoint as our position. So now if you consider triangle OS1P, in that triangle what is happening, your, this side is X1 let's say, this is X1, this side is X2, and the middle one is the radius R itself, and this distance here is D by 2 and this distance is D by 2. So in this triangle, you can see x1 is square root of r square plus d by 2 ka whole square minus 2 times r into d by 2 into cos of the angle between them, which is pi minus theta. So x1 becomes square root of r square plus d square by 4 plus rd cos theta. This pi minus theta. This, this angle over here, this one. This angle. This is pi minus theta. That angle is theta. So, with this now, use a approximation. So x1 is approximately equal to square root of r square plus rd cos theta. This is neglecting d square by 4 because r is very large compared to d. And this is further r into 1 plus d by r cos theta to the power half. So x1 can be approximated as r into 1 plus d by 2 r cos theta. And similarly, x2 you will see it's square root of r square plus d square by 4 minus 2 r d by 2 into cos theta. Doing that same treatment, you will see x2 is approximately equal to r into 1 minus d by 2 r cos theta. So these are the values with this approximation capabilities. So now you can write the path difference at any point delta x. So 
that part difference becoming d by r cos theta. Oh, sorry, it's just becoming d cos theta. That capital R is also. So basically, it is d lambda cos theta. So for constructive, we have three lambda cos theta, which is our path difference, is equal to three lambda, two lambda, lambda and zero. So this is theta is equal to cos inverse one. That is zero. This is theta equal to cos inverse. Two by three. This is theta equal to cos inverse one by three, and this is theta equal to cos inverse zero for ninety degrees. So these will give us constructive interference. Whereas for destructive interference, we have that condition that. Delta x d cos theta or three lambda cos theta is n plus half lambda. So three lambda cos theta could either be three lambda by two. So you can start with the value of. Five lambda by two because this is three now. So two and a half is the maximum value for the for the circuit. So theta will come cos inverse five by six. So this is your first one, or it can be three by two lambda. So theta will come cos inverse half. That is sixty degree. This is the second one. Or this is lambda by two. That will be theta equal to cos inverse one by six. So three positions of destructive interference, and मतलब in one quadrant. So overall, twelve positions of destructive interference and twelve positions of constructive interference. Respectively, for theta going from zero to okay, but the individual positions that this is how you calculate them by using this approximation method. So this kind of thing can be used in wave optics also, a variation of YDSC. Okay, people. So hope this is clear. Okay. Now next, uh, let's look at problem involving. Standing waves with extra constraint. Sometimes this kind of question can be can be interesting mathematically.
this is a rigid wall and then here we have this kind of situation This is a fixed smooth pole. This is a ring that can slide free. So this is a thread of linear mass density. So nine gram per centimeter and this is a group of linear mass density 25 gram per centimeter and there are lengths L2 and L1 and the junction point so Given that tension is equal to 2500 newtons, and L1 is let us see. Point five meters and L two is let us say three point two meters. We have to find the fundamental frequency and the formula for nth overtone mode if situation A In situation A, we do this. The junction is placed in a narrow aperture or a narrow hole. So it is constrained to be unknown. And situation D the junction is actually attached to an oscillator. The junction is attached. An oscillator of a resonant frequency and so constrained to be in anti -mode. Okay. 
So just try out the security. So the linear mass densities are lambda 1 and lambda 2. Okay, I have used the symbol lambda for linear mass density, not wavelength. They are given gram per centimeter. And the tension, of course, will be common on the rope and the string. And that is given to you. And the natural lengths are also given. So just try this out with it.
Okay, so I'll help you out uh, with this type of problem. So first of all, see what is happening is that suppose we have for a given frequency or a resonant frequency f. If this is let's say string e and this is string b. This uh, lambda in string a that is wavelength, this thing, not this thing, okay, not uh, linear mass density. That is going to be one upon f square root of tension divided by mu one. Let's write this as mu one, and let's write this as mu two. And lambda v is one upon f square root t by mu. So you can see that lambda e by lambda b ka ratio kya hoga hai so it will be square root of mu2 by mu1. So that is how much square root of 25 by 9. So it is 5 by 3. So jo bhi lambdas hai, unka ratio kitna hoga 5 is to 3. This is a universal fact, whether we are going to the first constraint or the second constraint. So this is one thing to keep in mind. So now you see, in situation A, so ask her what is happening in Chakshu and Omkar. Don't two of you guys are here. Omkar has disappeared for some reason. Maybe some connection problem. Anyway, so in situation B, what is my junction point? What is my node? And this ring wala point is this anti-node. So because this is not constrained to have any fixation. Okay? And this is a fixed point, so this is node. So this length L2, it has to be, this was the spin B, this was the spin E. This has to be an integer multiple of lambda by 2. Because both ends are nodes. Okay? And where is this length L1, it has to be some odd multiple of lambda by 4, so lambda e by 4. This is how we work out the constraint. Okay. So, ye, okay. lambda e by 4, yeah, you can say it is n plus half. You can just write this as n plus half times lambda e by 2 because here one end one end is more than the other end it's anti so it's understood how we work out the constraint now so l2 by l1 has to be n uh, upon 2m plus 1 the rest of it will become 2n upon 2n plus 1 lambda v by lambda v. This is the constraint relation that we have where n is actually starts from 1 and m also starts from 1. So you can see here what are the lengths we are taking. L2 was I think 3, right? And L1 was this one. L2 was 3 and L1 was 2.5. So 3.0 upon 2.5 must be an even number divided by an odd number times lambda b by lambda a. Or who we have nikala that lambda e by lambda b kitna hai apne pas. See that lambda e by lambda b was 5 is to 3. So they should be 3 by 5. So this should be 1 3 by 5. So we are getting the relationship that 2n upon 2n plus 1, just transfer this that side, is equal to 3 cancels out, and this is 5 by this. So we are getting an even number to an odd number should be 2 
equals to 1. So here we can take n equal to 1. And m equal to 0 will give us 2n equal to 2 and 2n plus 1 equal to 1. So this is our fundamental rule. This is corresponding to f. Then, for example, if we take n equal to 2, so ye kitna jayega? 4 is 2. So we get 2m plus 1 equal to how much? We get 4. So this is not possible. Basically, if we take 2m plus 1 as 1, we get 2n as 2, so that's okay. Then next possible value of 2m plus 1 is 3, because it's an odd number. So here, we will get this 2n as 6, so that's okay. Then 5, so we'll get 2n as 10. So this is giving us n equal to 1, n equal to 3, n equal to 5, as m is 0, n is 1, n is x. Okay. So that means, so this is the fundamental, this is the first over, this is the second over. And like that, m is equal to some m, n will become twice of this will become the mn over time. Okay, so that that is the formula. So you can see the in this constraint the fundamental will look like this. n is equal to 1 and n is equal to 0. The first overtone will look like this. As a the heavy rope will be in this kind of state. And the lighter rope will be in the same. M is equal to 1. 2 n plus 1 is 3. M is equal to 3. So, here your length are L2. In this case, may, this will become 3 times lambda V by 2. And here your length are L1. That will become 3 by 4 times lambda e. For this case, my equal length L2, that would have been lambda b by 2, or equal length L1, that would have been lambda e by 2. Okay. So, this is now how we find the fundamental frequency. We we'll just get it by the formula. So, fundamental frequency is. 1 by lambda b in this case, square root t by mu t or 1 by lambda t square root t by mu t, whichever. So in this case, this will be 1 by 2L2 square root t by mu t, which will be equal to 1 by 4L1 square root t by you can see that that will become 1 by 
six into square root of twenty five hundred divided by this was twenty five. This thing per centimeter, so that's twenty five to the power minus one. So let's just change that to two point five and this thing. So that, or whatever, let it be like this. Doesn't matter. So that will be the same thing as one by four into two point five. So that is ten. Into square root of t, which is twenty five hundred divided by this was uh, nine. You see, these two frequencies are same. That is the formula for the fundamental. Now your first overtone will become third harmony. Second overtone will become fifth harmony. Like that. So, mth overtone will become two by two plus one h harmony for fundamental. So this is the formula. Guys, is this clear? Uh, so, Bhaskar, you were asking me that. Sorry, Chakshu. So, constraint time problem is is the constraint concept clear in this one? So, if the odd number, even number, the ratio and all that one has to be little careful. When when this kind of uh, there are three boundary problems here, but not two boundaries, but there's also middle point which is acting like a boundary condition or a constraint point. So it's like our situation has three boundary conditions or three constraints. That one end is a node, the other end is a node or anti node or whatever, and some in between point is also either a node or anti node. So that time you have to look at both the parts simultaneously. So one one end of the string to the middle point or whatever, and the other end of the string to the junction or whatever. So, okay, guys. So, okay. So, uh, can I leave you to try out the second part yourself because I'm running a little bit out of time over here. I have lecture at two. Okay, guys. So, uh, just try out the second part of this yourself. And if you have difficulty, drop me a message. I'll help you out. And couple of your doubts which are uh, pending, I will try to solve them and send them to you. Or otherwise, discuss in the next class. There's that uh, that question of the heat pump. That one. And also one more question uh, which Bhaskar has sent, so that also discuss with him. Okay, thanks guys. Okay, all the best and see you next time. In the meantime, uh, keep sending me your doubts if anything is urgent. All the best, guys.